Um, welcome, welcome everybody to this um, February uh, uh, talk in our series of talks on uh, relating in some way to the history of Norwich. Uh, I'm Michael Blackwell and I coordinate the, the work of the Norwich Society Historians Group. I'd like to um, welcome many of you who have not uh, joined us before. Uh, some of you, um, um, not even this, in this country, where you're, you're very welcome. Uh, for those of you who are not members of the society, we'd like to encourage you to join. It's a great society to join. There's, uh, you can make lots of friends, but um, you get access to these talks, publications, and all kinds of things. But also, you'll be helping a group of people who want to preserve the history of Norwich and to make sure that the future of Norwich is not marred by ugly developments and, uh, and the city develops it in and keeps its status as a fine city. So if you can join us, that would be great. If you go to our website, which is thenorwichsociety.org.uk, so that's not norwichsociety.co.uk, but thenorwichsociety.org.uk, there you can um, see a button which says support us, and that will take you to um, our membership signing on page. And if you don't want to become a member, but like to make a donation, you'll find a way of doing it there. Before I introduce uh, this morning's speaker, just a little bit about how this uh, session will work. Um, you will see at the bottom of your screen, somewhere in the middle, a button called, uh, it says Q and A. Um, now, if you have uh, questions that you would like to uh, ask the speaker, if you just type them into that Q and A, I will see these as they come and I will then collect them and uh, we'll ask uh, Philida at the ask questions to Philida at the end. So you can do it any time throughout the session. It won't disrupt uh, anyone else. And uh, then I'll be able to ask them at the end. OK, this morning, we're, we're very happy to have uh, Philida Scrooms with us. Uh, Philida is very busy uh, as a public speaker, and so we're very happy that she's been able to come and uh, speak to us today. Uh, Philida is one of the graduates of the amazing UEA um, Creative Writing uh, course, and um, just since uh, her graduation, she's, she's written uh, three books, all of which have been very successful, winning uh, uh, the East Anglia um, Award for Best Biography uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, her latest book tells a story that a lot of people kind of knew vaguely about, but uh, there was never any um, source of um, understanding what happened in 1874 and the terrible accident coming out of Norwich Thorpe Station. So, um, Philida, thank you for being with us, and I'll turn the time over to you. Thank you so much, and, and it's a real pleasure to be here this morning. And as it's raining, it's rather nice that I haven't got to go out to the Assembly House, although I have loved giving talks in that fabulous building many times. Um, yes, thank you for that introduction, and you're absolutely right. I'm not a Norwich girl. Um, I came up here in 2004 from Surrey, and uh, immediately joined the Thorpe um, History Group uh, as I bought a house out in Thorpe St Andrew. And that actually leads directly to my third book. Uh, my first was Escaping Hitler, the story of Joe Sterling, um, still a legend in the city. Uh, and then the book you alluded to that won the award, I was very proud, was the Lady Lord Mayors of Norwich. So by 2018, I was in a good position to have a look at the story of the Thorpe Great Railway disaster, particularly having honed my skills on family history research and history generally and how to work my way around the uh, website uh, and particularly the British newspaper archive. So by now I was in a position to write this third book that had been rattling around in my head ever since I first moved to Thorpe. So I'm going to now share my screen with everybody um, right, so this is the book. Let me move on to a prettier picture. There we are. So this is a, obviously a modern aerial shot of Thorpe St Andrew as we know it today, but it was known as Thorpe Next Norwich in Victorian times and, and slightly beyond, although they were just changing to use the Thorpe St Andrew name as well about that time. So here you can see the uh, Yarmouth Road here coming along here, and this is the River Yare, of course. Um, I point this out because it shows the 
close proximity of myself writing this book to the actual place where it happened. This house here, just the little blue one with the panels on the roof right over the river, was the forge at the time run by Thomas Saverton, and he was one of the heroes of the night and we come to them later, but is actually where I'm speaking to you from now, for I am very fortunate to live on this beautiful part of the river um, opposite directly Thorpe Island here with all the trees, and this is the critical part of the story. For Thorpe Island was only created when the railways came to Norwich and well, Norfolk generally um, in the 1840s. We were a little behind the curve for the rest of the country. Our landowners were not keen to give up their patches of land to have the railways built, but uh, they were persuaded that they should uh, get into the new fangled form of transport. So every day, and to this day, of course, the trains between Norwich and Yarmouth and beyond to Lowestoft, etc., rattle along the other side of this island. Just it's hardly uh, any width at all. It's just the railway line is just down the side of the slide there. So as I'm researching and writing about these people who were on board that night and what happened, I am literally in the throw of it. Thomas Sabatum himself ran to the site, as did the people who lived in all the posh houses along the front here. Uh, the, the village was really building into a popular spot to buy a weekend home or even to move, and lots of people came out of the city. Um, there was a thriving rowing club, three pubs. It was, it was really a great place to be, as it still is. And this is the church, of course, today. That was only 10 years old when the accident happened. And just in front, you can just see it above the trees there, there is the ruins of the original church, one of the smallest in Norfolk. And as I discovered that some of the people involved in the railway accident had been married in earlier years in that little uh, chapel, a little area there that we love so much in this village. Um, how exciting was that? It, it really was lovely to join all the dots. So I just put that picture up to set the scene and explain why I was so keen, once I had done my MA and written the first two books, to get on and write about the accident. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happened that night perhaps um, think about why it happened. But even more important to me as a biographer, I'm going to introduce you to some of the people who were involved. Up until now, the, the accident has been documented. It does appear as a chapter in various books about railway disasters. It also has, people have written in blogs about it. But nobody up to that point, I believe, had taken the time out to research those 27 or 28, because there is one that you know, could well be, um, who died as a direct result of this accident. Um, what were their lives like? Who were their parents? Where were they born? What did they do? And those that survived, what did they go on to do? I needed to know. Uh, so this will be a part of the talk today. So let's go back to Great Yarmouth Station at 9 p.m. on Thursday, the 10th of September, 1874. And those of you who know the station will re maybe recognize that drawing there as an artist's impression that appears on the wall outside the station entrance, showing how it may have looked in those times. And you can see the steam engine just arriving on the right there, uh, and the cab sitting outside, the horse-drawn cab, again, very relevant to the story. And here's a image of people climbing aboard the train. It is pouring down. The wind is blowing a hoolie, much like the weather we've been having recently. Last Friday, I did rather think about the day in September 1874 because I'm sure the weather was stormy and grim. But in those days, you didn't get many days off work. So you tried not to let the weather bother you. And if you had things to do on a rainy day, you just went and did them. So at 9 p.m., here's the train sitting in Great Yarmouth Station, ready to head off into uh, Norfolk and beyond and to, well, into Norwich. So let's move on. This is the route they expected to take. Now this map rather postdates the um, accident. So a few of those stations didn't exist at the time, but it's good enough for our purposes today. So here's the train in Yarmouth. It's now going to go along here. This is all double track and that is important. Double track down here, pulls into Reedham where it stops to pick up the Lowestoft train. The Lowestoft train had left the coast, similar time to Yarmouth, come along here, 
and there it is at Reedham, where the coaches are attached to the rear of the Yarmouth train. Now, in Lowestoft that day was an amazing fruit and veg show, the annual one that they always held, and it was held on the pier, and it was just a lovely um, event, and there were some super um, newspaper reports about that event in the um, on the archives there from the, our local papers, uh, are full of colour and excitement, including the fact that the band of the Royal Hussars were going to play in the evening. And as such, Great um, Eastern Railway, who were running the railways at this time, uh, had decided to put on a special late train about 10 o'clock to bring people back so that they could hear the, um, the band before going home. But because the weather was so grim, I believe that many people decided, no, you won't do that. We'll go home about half past eight, as usual, uh, nine o'clock sort of touch. Uh, and, and they climbed on board that last train. So there we are. We've got the joined trains and they now leave and go up here and pull into Brundle. Now, Brundle is a lovely little village just down the road from Thorpe St Andrew. Um, it's just on the edge of the broad there. And uh, it's, a, it's a lovely riverside village, as it was then, of course. And the point of this was that is where the double track finished. From then on in to Norwich itself, Norwich Thorpe Station, was the, the still got a single track. Now, the irony of this is that that doubled track had already been laid. It was available. It was there. But the inspectors had not yet been round to give it the all clear on the safety checks, which sounds very contemporary, doesn't it, really? Um, so sadly, uh, they, it wasn't laid, it wasn't ready to use at that point, and it was a single track. So, as has been happening for many decades, um, about 30 years, in fact, since the railways came, the train from Yarmouth was to sit in a siding just outside Brundle to await the express from London via Norwich to rattle through um, to clear that single line. And at Thorpe Station that evening uh, at 9.20, here's a picture of our original Norwich station. This is not the station building that we know and love so well here in Norwich. That wasn't built until the very end of the century. This was the first one that was erected as the first station in Norfolk in the eight, early 1840s when the railways came. Um, and that's the wonderful uh, glass roof there. You can imagine the rain pelting down on it that night, making a heck of a racket. Uh, and if you just look at these uprights here, with the wrought metal, decorated metal um, railings just inside here, inside each little triangle there, these were transported to our station when they built it at the end of the century. So next time you're on the platform waiting for a train, do look up and just think that these bits of decorated ironwork had actually first been placed in that station, which was just a bit further up the line, around the corner towards Morrison's, uh, where they have the big store for, for engines and things nowadays. That's where it was. And on this particular evening, yet again, the express from Norwich was running late. Now, Great Eastern had a good accident record. Um, they'd, they'd seemed to manage not to have any big passenger accidents. They'd lost many staff, of course. People were forever falling off the top of carriages, walking in front of um, trucks. Uh, generally, uh, health and safety was pretty uh, dire in those days. I'm sure we all know. Um, and But they hadn't had any big accidents. But their punctuality was well known throughout the country for being very poor. And if you look at the um, letters to the editor in uh, contemporary newspapers of the 1840s onwards, there are letters always complaining about the Great Eastern um, when, when they took over uh, and how bad the uh, punctuality was. And the same was this evening. So all those people there on the platform are really getting rather impatient for the train to pull in. And there's the station itself. You can see that, that picture there. It, it's a lovely print um, with the rather lovely Italianate tower, a very popular design for public buildings at that time. Uh, it's quite a lot smaller than our current one. And you can see again the cabs outside uh, waiting for passengers and the Victorian people stood there on the station. Uh, and at nine o'clock that evening, let's come to our first named character from the story. And this is Night Inspector Alfred Cooper. 
a man in his 40s, a family man, he used to be a policeman as a young man, but he's been working now for the railways for about 17 years, um, and he lives just down Riverside. So he turns up about nine o'clock to start his shift. He must have been very wet. So he shakes down his great coat and he goes to see his station master, Henry Sprawl. And he says, so I understand the London train is late again and hasn't yet arrived. Do we know when it will come? And Henry says, well, no, and usually we haven't actually had a telegraph yet telling us whereabouts it is, so I've no idea when it's going to arrive. Well, the two men now have a decision to make because normally the train would go and then they'd send the message off to Brundle to say, you know, once the train's gone past you, you can send the train up from Yarmouth. But they don't know how long this is going to be. And I believe the two men get a bit grumpy with each other. Uh, I was reading a lot of transcripts from various uh, trials and tribunals and things that happened later. And you can see from, from the witness accounts that these two men did have a bit of an argument, for they both had differing opinions of what to do next. But Alfred takes control and he marches from the office and goes to the telegraph office, a very tiny room right on the platform there. And he goes to speak to his young telegraph operator, John Robson. 17 years old, only been in the job less than a year, but a very responsible job. Not only does he have to send telegraphs out to all the stations to find out where the trains are and to uh, give instructions, but he also serves the public through the little window um, in, in the wall of the room. Uh, if we want to send a telegraph to a newspaper or to our bank or to our Aunt Mabel in London, we would go and pay the money and he would send it. So he's quite adept now at this wonderful machine you can see here, which was a Cook and Wheatstone five needle telegraph machine. And it was placed in the station when it was built in the 1840s. It was the first station in the whole of the country to take on this brand new technology, a bit like getting a, a PC in uh, those days gone by um, on your desk uh, when, when computers first came in. But this particular evening, and maybe because it was raining outside, John Robson had his mates in, three or four young men sitting with their feet on the desk, chatting about their girlfriends and their landladies and the price of a pint of beer uh, and generally distracting their young friend. And Alfred Cooper is not best pleased. And he barks at the boy, send a message down to Brundle, tell them to send the, the mail train up for this nine o'clock train from Yarmouth was in fact the mail train as it was every night. Send the mail train up. We're not going to wait for the London train. So Robson dutifully writes that down on a piece of paper and as he goes to hand it to his boss, uh, Alfred, to sign off the chit as the rules dictate, the London train pulls in to the station, filling the air with black smoke and noise and the, the passengers are very pleased to see it. At this second, Alfred turns on his heel and walks towards the platform to help turn the train around as quickly as possible. So now young John has another dilemma. What does he do? He's got the instruction, but he hasn't got his boss's signature. But he would love to show off the fact to his friends that he can use this wonderful machine. So he does send the message down to Brundle. And the Brundle station master instantly picks it up and writes back, no, and drops that, that's it, drops the, the, the um, flag to let the train go and then writes back, train gone. Well, it's a little bit of a lull, but just at that moment, the train from London is let go as well. So we've now got two trains entering the single track, one at each end between Brundle and Norwich. Cooper goes back to the telegraph office and says, um, we've just let the London train go. You didn't send the message down to Brundle, did you? Um, well, actually, I, I did, but I didn't sign it. Now, the two men have differing opinions when it comes to the trial. So none of us will ever know exactly what went on that night. But it certainly looks as if they were both at fault. Um, and at that moment, they would have instantly known what was going to happen. So as I said to you, it was a really wet and windy night, which meant that the visibility for those drivers 
Um, Thomas Clark was one of them, coming from Norwich, and John Pryor, both Norwich men. Um, and there they are on that uh, wet and windy line. And if I could just uh, bear with me a moment, and I will read you a short bit of the prologue from the book, which describes what it was happening. Two massive steam engines, each traveling at 30 miles per hour, visibility poor due to blinding rain and squalling winds, two frustrated drivers racing to make up time, both men aware of running late due to delays beyond their control, both drivers unaware that the two trains are traveling on the same single line on a catastrophic collision course. The mail train from Yarmouth passes by the eerie buildings of the Norfolk Asylum, gas-lit windows offering little respite from the pitch black night. It then thunders towards the wooden bridge over the River Yare at Thorpe Next, Norwich. The express from Norwich enters the same bridge, towering high above the lights from the Three Tons pub on the river bank below. Both crews on the footplate instinctively sense that something is fast approaching through the gloom. But despite every effort, they realize with horror that it is far too late to apply the brakes. And at 9.30 that evening, the two trains do indeed collide head on, uh, just past the Three Tons pub known as the Rush Cutters today. And these um, pictures come from the London Illustrated News of the following Saturday. And of course they didn't have eyewitnesses uh, from, from the newspaper there at the time, but they would have sent their reporters up once the news broke about the accident to find eyewitnesses, to talk to people, and from their descriptions, draw what they, the artist's impression of how it would have seemed. And from the newspaper accounts, the two engines did hit fast. And, and they were heavy machines. And the, one of the, the funnels instantly sheared, falling into someone's back garden. The two engines went up in the sky um, into a pyramid, falling away with a shower of small chips of wood from these very thin carriages. Uh, and then the whole co um, collection of wood and metal started to just creak and fall and bits would come out, bodies were thrown from the carnage. It was generally a terrible scene of mayhem. And in the village, everyone heard what they thought was an enormous clap of thunder. Some reports say it could be heard in the city. Um, and at first, many would have thought it was just part of the storm, but no, it was much worse. And as they looked out of their doorways, they would have seen the black plume of smoke coming from above the pub um, and the dreadful sound of creaking metal. Um, and they would have run. They took their gas lamps and they ran, whether they be the master of the house. And there were many very wealthy men who arrived in probably their evening wear down to the butlers and the footmen and the grooms and the gardeners, the sh shopkeepers, um, the seamstresses, the, 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 the vicar was actually out that night. He was somewhere at a meeting. We'll come to that a little later. But they did run towards the carnage and began immediately to pull the bodies and the wounded out of the uh, metal rubbish and um, dreadful uh, sight there. Um, now, if you were in the rear carriages, you were the lucky ones. And that included those people from Lowestoft, from the um, vegetable show, because the rear carriages were just felt a bit of a shudder. It was the central ones that really took the brunt. And some of these were first class carriages. And at the other end of the train over the bridge was a collection of Masonic gentlemen who had had a wonderful evening out at a super dinner at the Assembly House uh, to celebrate a new lodge being opened in Upper St Giles Street. It's still there today, of course. And they reported the fact that they didn't know what on earth had happened. And they were able to climb down onto the bridge and make their way with other walking wounded back down the Yarmouth Road towards the city. At the point of the, uh, just before the accident, most probably, the team at the station in Norwich got together and the realisation passed between them that there was nothing they could do to stop a head-on collision. There were no mobile phones, 
You couldn't send a telegraph into the cab of a railway engine. Uh, so what could they do? They could do nothing but call for surgeons. While Robson and Clark were both being set down from duties, um, the station master sent the cabmen, and there's one, an illustration of one, sitting outside the station, out to the Norwich, uh, Norfolk and Norwich Hospital on Newmarket Street, and out to Upper St Giles Street and St Giles Street, where all the consultants and uh, wealthier doctors lived in their rather smart houses. Um, and they did that, they went and found them. And I imagine many of them had to put out their cigars and put down their sherry and grab their bags and head for the railway station. And many, many did. And they were put inside a special maintenance train and ch they chugged up up the line towards Yarmouth, not knowing exactly where they would find it, but knowing they would find a collision. And as I was writing about this particular passage, I could hear those trains going past my house and I could imagine exactly what was going on. Uh, to show you the trains, uh, I will admit at this point that I was not an expert by any means. I knew very little about Victorian trains or railways. It wasn't really in my sphere, uh, but I did seek out people who do, do know. And I had many coffees and long email discussions with people who know all about this, this particular genre. And these are the closest photos I could get of the actual engines. Obviously, the two original ones were write-offs, but the designs carried on for quite a while. And they were both designed by Robert Sinclair, who was very big in his field at the time as a designer. Uh, and this was the, uh, an example of the Yarmouth to Norwich mail train. The mail train that actually crashed was number 54. And you can see this one here. And on the rear of the one that night on the behind this, the actual engine in the tender was a whole load of fish a fresh catch from the North Sea into Yarmouth, uh, de destined for the markets of Norwich and beyond. And people were falling into that tender of fish. And again, they were the lucky ones. They survived, they had a soft landing. And it did also provide a cushion between the engine and some of the carriages. 27 people died, it's worth mentioning that. Um, 17 on the night. Uh, and many, many more would have died if it hadn't been for these details, including the Express from London, here she is. This is an example of the same train, uh, slightly bigger, number 218 at the time, and his first tender behind the coal one was a horse box. It actually had a horse, so it may have been a mule. Uh, newspapers disagree in that one. Uh, but again, the poor uh, creature did die instantly, but it did again create a bit of a cushion. Now I put this up to show you the other end of the village and, it, and to explain about the cut. Now, those of you who know the area will know that this is the River Yare um, along here. I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, but if you, if you can't, um, I'm sure I'll describe it to you. This is, the, the river is clearly uh, between the island and the main road here. And before the railways came, it would have just meandered along and there would have been a big the grass area, there'd have been no gap, it wouldn't have been an island, it would just have gone straight across to Whitlingham. But then, of course, they needed a straight line, straight line as possible between uh, the coast and Norwich. And this meant um, chopping a big canal to take the wherries, for we were still using the big masted wherries to get to goods and people up and down the rivers. And now, of course, once they put the rail down, with the bridges, the necessary bridges at each end of that section to go over the year, uh, they needed a wide piece of waterway that didn't have any bridges on. And this is what they did. They, they cut the cut, literally dug the cut. And there's a fabulous piece of, foot, of, of uh, writing in the local papers about the navvies coming to town. And they came um, in the, again, early 1840s, and they were the, the, the big strapping builders who had been building the canal network around the country. Many of them were Irish labourers. And once uh, the railways came, they were set to work building the railways. Uh, and when they came to um, Thorpe and Andrew and, and beyond digging this cut, it is said that the good ladies of the village and of the city, particularly on a nice sunny day, would take a little stroll or maybe get their carriage out or ride a horse to come and just watch as these big burly men, probably stripped to the waist, were digging away at their labour. And people were so worried about the men 
um, perhaps being um, abusive to the to the women that they put a lot of policemen on duty. I rather think that it was the men who were in danger from the women, but that's just my opinion. Um, so there you have it, and the uh, you can see I will point. Um, you can see the uh, rush cutters there, just by the, the bridge at the top of that uh, that picture there, uh, and the accident took place just on the line behind those hedges and bushes. Now, if you go up the road and walk beyond the rush cutters today, there's a little lane called Girlings Lane. Walk to the very end of it, look over the uh, gate there onto the railway line, turn to your right, and you will see the site of the accident just beyond the bridge, um, your, your side of the bridge in Girling Lane. And it is quite an eerie experience to do that. And here is the Three Tons pub. This drawing was made only a few years after the accident. The caption that comes with it actually mentions uh, the, the railway accident on it. Those of you who know that pub will know it doesn't look hardly any different at all. They've maintained the actual look of it, and, which is lovely. But you can see that the bridge is different. The bridge there is a very low bridge, um, wooden, of course, it's now metal naturally. Um, and this is where the two or three carriages at the end of the London train were stuck. Nobody drowned, amazingly. They did dredge the river looking for bodies, but there were none. Um, everybody managed to, the walking wounded, of which there were over 100, managed to get down from the carriages and make their way into the city, as I say. Now, just behind that wooden bridge, you can just see a little triangular structure. And that's a boat, boat yard. It no longer exists, but it belonged to a chap called Stephen Field, who was one of the heroes from the story. For he gave over his um, boat yard that night to lay out the injured and some of the dead um, in to order to shelter them while they were waiting for transportation back into the city. And meanwhile, if you look at the right hand, left hand side of the Rushcutters pub, that's where the Skittle Alley was. It's now part of the dining room at the very far end. And as they dragged dead bodies from the carnage, they were carried with great respect, it, it, it uh, offers you in the newspapers, uh, into that building and laid out in the Skittle Alley in order that the relatives could come up from the city once the word got out to identify their relatives and friends. Next time you're having a pint or maybe a meal in the Rushcutters pub out in Thorpe and Andrew, just think about that for a moment. It must have been a really dreadful, dreadful night. John Hart, the publican of the time, who went on to build uh, boats himself later as Hart Boats, um, a famous uh, local boat building company, as was, um, was also very generous in um, helping, going out with his torch, uh, digging out the people, helping the wounded, and generally giving his hospitality to anyone who turned up. And the following morning, because those um, walking wounded going into the city had told people about what was happening, the police would have picked up on it, um, and the newspaper journalists did too. And the Eastern Daily Press, the same newspaper, of course, that we enjoy today, uh, the very first local newspaper in the country, um, got hold of the story and they ran it the following morning on the Friday. And where they would normally sell about uh, 2,000 copies, they sold 10 times that many the following morning. Everyone wanted to learn about what was happening that previous night in Thorpe Next Norwich. And then the following day, Saturday, Everybody in the country knew the name Thought Next Norwich and were reading about the accident. And as you can see there, fearful railway accident at Thorpe, 17 people killed, uh, more than 30 injured. The numbers rose, of course, um, over the days, but the stories were there. And it is said that Queen Victoria, who was at Balmoral at the time, would have also read the story and probably discussed it with the Prime Minister, who was visiting for lunch. Um, and these stories didn't stop there. They kept on going. They were following the news from the accident as they went through the various deaths, the various um, tribunals, and we come to that shortly. But it is fascinating when you start looking around the newspaper um, site online, British Newspaper Archive, how many diverse um, towns, cities, uh, journals covered the news from Norwich. So now we come to what was interesting me particularly. I was aware that every, every year the EDP print a list of the, of the 28 dead 
and some of the survivors as a memorial to the people from the accident. But you didn't get any more details. No one actually seemed to, in my mind, have taken the time out for it is a time consuming exercise to look into the lives of these people. Who were they? You know, what, what happened to them? Uh, what had happened to them in their lives? Why were they on board that night? And so I took it upon myself to do that. And I discovered very quickly that the travelers represented every, every part of Victorian social strata. Uh, right from the top in usually the first class carriages were doctors and surgeons, um, a medical botanist who worked out of Surrey Street, he ran an advert every week in the EDP, suggesting that his lotions and potions could cure you of anything. He did actually go bankrupt, so I imagine he wasn't actually that good. Uh, there were clergymen, with the one with their fam one his family, um, others, lawyers, factory owners, farmers, um, the beautiful 18-year-old heiress, we come to Ellen shortly, and an unidentified mystery man. This kept the press happy for a few days. Um, this poor chap was laid out with others in the uh, Skittle Alley, and nobody came to claim him. And he was the last man there. Um, and he had a lovely silk shirt on. He was clearly reasonably well off, and it was monogrammed with his initials. So what happened was that the following day, when the word got out and Great Yarmouth people began to hear about it, a hotelier from Great Yarmouth got in touch with the police in Norwich and said, one of my guests has not returned home. Um, I was expecting him back on the last train, on the mail train, um, not the mail train, sorry, the last the train from, from London, he was coming home. I had told him that because it was raining, he should not stay in Yarmouth and enjoy the, the, uh, the walks and the air and the sea. He should go into the city and go to the museum. Well, I bet he regretted that uh, advice later, for in fact, it did turn out that this was the mystery man. And the police went to his hotel room, opened his suitcase, found more monogrammed shirts and a letter from his brother in London, who was summoned to come and collect his body. What a sad story. But as I looked into the story, I uncovered a scandal. I uncovered that his, that his mother uh, had had children by a wealthy man in Poole in Dorset, illegitimately. That wealthy man had been one of the first men to get a divorce from his first wife. Uh, divorce was very unheard of in those days. Um, and how she had been kept by him, a kept woman. And uh, it, was, it is a fascinating story, and, and I document it. Uh, then we go down to the fishmongers, a couple of lads from King's Lynn, uh, domestic servants, many of those, of course, dressmakers, milliners, shop girls. One of the ladies who looked after it was manageress at one of our big department stores. It wasn't Jowls, but it was a similar one of the time. She was uh, well missed when she was taken. Uh, saddlers, former soldiers, one of whom had fought in the Crimea, and a very sad story of an off-duty railway stoker who had taken his two Chinese children and his wife up to Yarmouth for the day on his very rare day off. And they didn't just come from around here, of course. And as a writer and a biographer, this meant I could look into areas beyond my own area. And I was learning stuff all the time. It was a really um, very exciting uh, and very sad, very salutary research job. They came from Claxton and Castle Acre, Great Yarmouth, of course, Beckles, Oldborough in Suffolk. That was a businessman who owned a draper. And when I learned what his grown up children did, they traveled the world opening businesses. That was equally fascinating. And those from, up from London who had stayed on that train at Norwich and kept on going towards the coast. If they'd got off, it would have been a different story from the Mile End Road and particularly in Shoreditch. Now, there aren't many photos of the people at the time because, of course, photography in 1874, it did exist, but it was in its very early infancy. And in fact, one of the doctors on board um, was known uh, for his uh, photography in the hospital. But meanwhile, he is Dr. Peter Ead and Mr. Charles Gilman. Now, these uh, pictures of them are from a much later time because I, it's no surprised to tell you if you know these names and I'm sure you will being a part of this group they are both very prominent men in Norwich history and they were both on the train from Yarmouth to Norwich that night what were the chances they both went on to become mayor of Norwich and they were both knighted by Queen Victoria and Peter Ede as I'm sure many of you know 
opened Chapelfield Gardens and many other great things for the city. And Charles Gilman was part of the, the family who started the famous Norwich insurance businesses. Um, and if they had been killed that night, you know, so the, the, the history of Norwich might have been quite different. Um, Peter Ede, and I'm grateful to him, and that's why his picture appears on the front cover of my book, wrote up the incident in his autobiographical work many years later. And he also wrote to the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, talking about the various wounds and injuries that came about because of the um, accident. And this was very, very useful hands um, on material, uh, primary source material that I could draw on for the chapters in my book. And here's Ellen Ramsdale. This is our 18 year old heiress. Um, her father um, had a, a, a auction house in Deerham and he died prematurely just a few years earlier, leaving his widow and three children, uh, an older sister to Ellen and a younger brother. Ellen was quite a feisty girl by all accounts. In three years time, she would inherit the uh, fortune, but for now her mother had it in trust and her mother was living in Essex Street. Uh, and Ellen went off to Yarmouth that day to see a friend and came back on the mail train. She sadly was crushed. Her legs were crushed by falling metal work um, from the engine, uh, but she did survive. And they carried her into the three tons uh, where a surgeon who had arrived from the hospital amputated her left leg with only brandy to sustain her. Uh, they always carried brandy. It was the absolute panacea in those days. Uh, and they would have given her some before they cut her leg, as I say. Uh, below the knee at first, then realised the knee wasn't going to survive. And so they cut again. This poor young woman was in the pub for three months. Because her mother was wealthy, she could afford to send in doctors and nurses on a daily basis. And the local press picked her up as a darling of the city. Everyone wanted to know updates about Ellen. Had, would she survive? What would happen to her? When could she go home? And they did cover the story. Um, she did go home in the January and uh, she would have got herself a wooden leg, but they were quite prominent at the time. There was a factory in Norwich that made them. Um, and she went on to live a reasonably long life. Uh, she was married, she never had any children, um, but she did go home to mum. But I did uncover that she was the only child of Mr. Ramsdale. The older sister was illegitimate by a wealthy man from mid Norfolk, as was the younger boy. And, it's, and it, was, it was extraordinary to discover what was going on. And that's why Ellen inherited the fortune rather than her older sister. And the older sister went to Australia married, this is important, go with me, married, had children, and just a week before, well, two weeks before the book was published last September, um, I had an email quite out of the blue from Australia. And a lady of middle years wrote to me and said, I've just picked up on Google an excerpt from your book. And I believe you've looked into the life of my great, great aunt Ellen. And sure enough, there's four sisters who are descendants of Ellen, of, of Ellen's sister. Uh, and although they didn't ever know Ellen, for she died in the 1920s, these four sisters know of her. They have photograph albums with her in. They know what happened to her. And they were so excited that I'd included her. They believed that she'd been in a railway accident in North London. But think about it, to Australians, Norwich is North London. They really did not realise, and they, they now knew the real story. And just to top this off, the, um, one of the sisters lives in London, had married a Brit and had come home to London. And she came up in her car for the grand launch at Gerald's at the end of September. She was the guest of honour in the front row. And the following day, I took her into the rush cutters for a coffee and to show her where her great, great aunt Ellen had spent three years of her life. And I love that when it happens. It happened a lot with Joe Sterling's story. I got people writing to me about how they knew him and how they'd worked with him. And now I'm getting letters from people who knew characters from this book, or not knew them, but obviously are descendants of. And, and that is just wonderful. And on the right there, you see Sergeant Robert Ward, one of those two soldiers who had fought for their country and now sadly lost their lives in a railway accident. 
the, uh, the obviously the four men at the front sadly died instantly and I'm afraid the descriptions in the newspapers of their bodies is not pretty but the GER did give them all wonderful um, ceremonial um, funerals and this is the only picture I could find of the four of them this is James Light the fireman from the on the Yarmouth train from Yarmouth um, and you can see him there in his smart jacket, very proud, young man, lived in the city. And that would have been his funeral card. And you can see the headstones. And when I speak to groups about this book, many people say, oh, we've seen those headstones out in Rosary Cemetery. They are quite a popular um, look on the, on the route. If you go around, you can see them. And what's interesting here is John Pryor was the driver. His is the taller of the two stones. And James Light was his fireman, as I say. And that's the shorter, and that was quite deliberate to show the status of the two men. The hospital features heavily in my book. I found it a fascinating place. And this lovely black and white picture of the uh, many of the consultants from the day was only taken two years before the accident. So they're quite contemporary how they would have looked. And you can see Peter Ede there at the back on the far right with his big mutton chops, looking a bit younger than that last picture you saw. In fact, they've all got that wonderful facial hair, haven't they? Isn't that a lovely picture? And I did pick up on two or three of them. Um, including Dr Beverly, who isn't actually there, but Dr Beverly was very big in Brundle history, opening Brundle Gardens. Uh, so they do have wonderful backstories themselves. And as my heroes of the day, I do cover some of them in quite a bit of detail. And there's a picture of the hospital, uh, slightly later than our time, but uh, and it was building all the time. Unfortunately, um, 10 people were admitted and seven of them did die over a period of months. Um, frankly, some of them died not from their wounds, but from septicemia. As you can imagine, um, the um, again, health and safety and cleanliness was uh, not quite up to modern day standards and people were dying from that. And they did in fact sort that out a bit later on uh, by having a complete cleanup and making it far more open plan. Uh, so uh, that was one of the results of that. And uh, we're nearly at the end now, so there was more to do. And the newspapers covered all these events, which went on right up to the following summer. There were the inquests, of course. And because some of the bodies, uh, some of the victims died in Broadland, it's the same today, isn't it? I live in Broadland. Many of you today will live in the city. Our bins are a different colour and were run by a different local authority. And the same in those days. So the people who died out in the rush cutters or at the scene would have had to have had the county uh, coroner and the county jury. Whereas those who died back here in the hospital or at home in the city would have had a city coroner. And you know what? The two juries could not agree with each other. And for many months, Norwich was a laughing stock in the press, the national press, because we could not get our legal system to meet up. Then they sent up a guy from London, a Captain Henry Tyler, who was the inspecting officer of the railways, was sent up from London to do a big inquiry here at the Guildhall to talk about whether there was a manslaughter case to answer. And they decided, yes, indeed, there was. And two of our characters did, in fact, face a manslaughter slaughter trial the following spring here at the Shire Hall in Norwich where a high court judge came up from London to take the trial, which lasted many, many days. Um, and those of you who saw the, um, um, oh, I've forgotten his first name, Ball, what's his first name? Anyway, you know what I mean, the, the former MP. Um, his Who Do You Think You Are would have seen pictures of the Shire Hall and you would have seen him uh, walking down the um, alleyway, the, the, the tunnel between the castle prison and straight into the courtroom at the Shire Hall. And that's the very walk that our two men would have taken on their way to their manslaughter trial in the April. And by the end of the summer, all the compensation cases had taken place too. Great Eastern had to pay out in the end the equivalent of four million pounds to the widows, the families, the victims who could no longer work, uh, anyone who brought a case against them. And I don't believe they've been looked at by many researchers in the past, for I have seen nothing about them, but I found all the details and fascinating reading it is. The lawyers that worked for the GER 
often were the same lawyers who worked the next day for one of the victims. I think they were just taking what they could. And to be honest, the GER did not have to pay out as much as the victims would have liked. There were some pretty slick lawyers on the case and uh, that would have kept readers of the local papers very happy for some time. And here's the scene today. So that photograph I took on the left there, the black and white, is of the actual site where it took place. And you can see way ahead uh, the bridge just over the air there. Uh, that's the last site of the rush cutters, the three tons as was, because that's taken from the bridge as we cross towards Yarmouth. Uh, the last site many of those people sadly would have ever seen, those ones from, from North Norwich heading towards Yarmouth. And below is the plaque, it doesn't read terribly well, but you may be able to see it on your screens, um, about the Thorpe Railway disaster, which is on a building down Girlings Lane, put there by members of the Yare History Group, who are very keen on their local history, they're amazingly knowledgeable. And if you ever get the chance to go on any of their walks uh, and guided tours, do take them. There's, there's a number this summer, and they're all on their website, just look up Thorpe uh, History Group. Um, and it does commemorate the people who died. Now, A, it says 25, and I believe firmly there were 28, because once you start looking ahead in time, you see people who died of their injuries that they knew nothing about, internal injuries that uh, killed them later. But equally, in two years' time, it'll be the 150th anniversary of this event, and not only will the paperback copy come out from Pen and Sword, but equally, I would like to uh, get together with the group to raise some money and put maybe a, a bigger and better uh, memorial up in the village to those people who died um, here on the riverside that night. And I wrote the book, um, it took three years, mainly in lockdown, which was difficult when you can't go up, as I'm sure many of you know, you can't go to the uh, record office, etc. cetera. Um, and, but I did manage it, it, it was a, a tough call, but I really did enjoy learning about these people particularly. And we had the launch, as I say, and on the, let me tell you, on the day, on the week after you have a launch at Jowell's, you're normally pretty sure of being high up in their bestsellers list because you've sold copies to all those who came to your talk. Um, and there I was the following week at number two in the Jowell's bestsellers list. Now, any ladies out there, I'll just direct this comment to you, a bit cheeky, but who would ever have thought that I would be able to say that I would be underneath Richard Osman and above Ed Balls? I can dream. But there we were, and I was very proud. It, it, it disappeared off the list the following week, but there you go. And then the reviews started coming in, and I'm so pleased to tell you that they're on Amazon right now. There are seven five-star reviews, and other reviewers have covered it too. And the reason I think it's doing as well as it is, and it, and it, and it really is, um, perhaps more than the other two perhaps, is because I really did play with it a bit. Everything in there is true, but I have written it a bit like a thriller. So you, the reader, only discover who lives and who dies after you've met them. And I'd like to think got quite fond of them. Um, and, and other little details that I kind of dramatize a bit. And it made it much more fun for me and hopefully a much more fun read for you. But as you read it, do bear in mind, it, it is all true, it did happen. Um, and I just feel that I have now brought those victims to life again. And, and I feel really pleased about that. And my cheeky advert at the end, really, showing my three books, um, showing that if you would like a signed copy of my book, a, a special rate of 18 pounds plus postage, do get in touch. There's my uh, email address and my home phone number. Very happy to talk to people um, about my books. And, uh, and thank you again for your attention today. And as we discussed earlier, I'm very happy to take questions. So I would just, if I may leave that a couple of seconds, but you can always get in touch with the um, Norwich Society if you haven't had a chance to take that down. And I'm going to stop sharing now, if that's all right, Michael, give me a nod. Yes, please. Uh -huh. Yes, here we go. So stop share and I'm back in the room. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Well, thank you, uh, Philip. That was actually a spellbinding talk. You know, <laughs> you. you really painted that picture so so well. Um,
And I think uh, actually that you must have held the attention, rapt attention of everybody because there weren't many questions that came in, um, but let me uh, give you a few. Okay. Um, first of all, not really a question, but Jennifer from Sydney uh, was watching. Oh, right. It must be the person that you talked about. I think it might have been. There she is, Jennifer. Jennifer, hello. How mm -hmm. exciting. I'm afraid you can't talk back to me on this particular um, effort but uh, yes indeed I was so grateful to Jennifer for writing to me and very excited and what is exciting especially exciting is I'm now starting to work on a review of the chapter about Ellen uh, because I can now add in more family detail because the, the ladies have been so generous sending me uh, more family information from their own genealogy work and and I just love that and, and more, and I will tell Jennifer, I've got a couple more characters whose relatives are also now in touch. And, and it just, it, for me, that is one of the most fascinating parts of this job as a biographer. Right, and one or two people have just said thank you for, for well, Heather says thank you for a marvellous talk. And oh, uh, thank you. I think that um, speaks to everybody. Well, they, um, tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the lack of, a proper commemorative plaque. I mean, it seems that it's um, something that ought to be done. Well, funnily enough, I did. I was reading about the church. I was looking into the history of the church. And sure enough, they um, did look after, after, after the event of putting something up in the church. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I've missed it. So I spoke to my local rector and we had, went and had a look. And no, there's nothing in there. So I suspect just fell by the wayside. What was fascinating was though how generous the Victorians were, and they were, weren't they? Um, they were giving money hand over fist afterwards. There were big appeals went out in the EDP, and the mayor was always the first to put his money down. And then Mr. Coleman, of course, Jeremiah, he was very generous. He put money down to help the widows and orphans, of which there were a number who were now totally destitute because their, their breadwinner had been killed, particularly the railway men. Um, so, yes, they, they were very much in the thoughts of people at the time. But as the years went by, obviously, you know, these things happen. It looked to me as if, no, there are no commemorative, commemorative things around. And then I discovered about the small one that the Thorpe History Group put up. But now we know a bit more about these people. It might be nice to do something a little bit, bit more, bit bigger, perhaps in the church, perhaps to, to do what they didn't do at the time. But uh, yes, it's, it's another project, put it that way. Uh, Stephen Walls asks about what was the outcome of the manslaughter trials? Oh, now, Stephen, I will say to you, this is the question everybody asks, mm -hmm. and I'm not about to give away spoilers because I'm trying to sell books. I'll be <laughs> honest, and I've seen uh, fiction writers do this as well on the TV. What I am prepared to tell audiences, and I will tell you, it was those two chaps from the Telegraph office. It was uh, young John Robson and it was Alfred Cooper who were both put on trial for manslaughter. And it was a very complicated case. And at the end of it, one of them walked free and disappeared from sight. No one can find him on all the records. And the other went down, as they say, at Norwich prison for eight months hard labor. Uh, I'm not gonna say any more than that, but that's certainly what happened. And it's uh, if you are, if you do go to, if you are a member of British Newspaper Archive, and it is a subscription site, but I think well worth it if you love history, and particularly family work, um, go and have a look and, and you will learn. It was about April of 1875. Have a look and uh, see what happened. But as far as readers go, I'd like them to learn for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, Louise asks, were any of the dead buried in Thorpe? Yes, indeed. The uh, driver, um, Thomas Clark, was a Thorpe uh, born, uh, born and raised, uh, and uh, he, he was living uh, not in Thorpe at the time, he was uh, in the city, but they brought his body back to where he was born. And he is prominent in our, um, what do you call it, um, the cemetery, I said, the open cemetery, up uh, to, as you go towards Sainsbury's, you know, it's on the right uh, on uh, Yarmouth Road before you get to Pound Lane. He's in there in the first oldest section, just underneath a big tree. It's difficult to describe where he is, but you go down the path, turn right, and he's just up there on the left. Um, no, none others I know of, but uh, he's certainly the best known one. And he's always pointed out when the members of the Thorpe History Group take people on a tour um, of the um, cemetery, he is, he is always commemorated then, yes. 
Okay, thank you. Um, we had one comment from somebody who lives in Thorpe and says, thank you. It's particularly interesting for a Thorpe St. Andrew resident. Good, good. And I think that basically is the last question I have. So um, oh, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, not everybody has, but even at, at talks, it is often goes very quiet. Um, and I think I just sort of stun everyone into, ah, was that what it was all about? So mm. I'm very happy with that. But it was such a pleasure to come on and do this for you today, guys. And thank you, thank you. So thank, thank you, Jill. And um, uh, sorry, uh, for um, those, um, you, those of you who would like to um, uh, buy the book, um, we will have all of that information on the Norwich Society website. And um, so please do take uh, <clears throat> advantage of that. Um, so but it was a it was a great talk. We um, it was really uh, I found myself on the edge of my seat. <laughs> <laughs> I was so glad. Hoping against hope that there would be that they'd stop before they hit each other. But, uh, yeah, that was, that was it, never going to happen. It was, it was <laughs> and I <clears throat> see uh, with interest that the foreword to your book has been written by Pete Goodrum. Indeed, yes, that's um, lovely man, lovely man. Uh, and who I just ha incidentally happened to hear on Radio Norfolk. Um, yes, yes, he was. Yes, yes. Um, and also, Pete Goodrum is our next speaker. Oh, um, great. Good link. Great link. To talk about the history of Jarrells, which is um, about 200, well, just over 250 years old yes. of the shop um, in the area. And uh, Pete's going to tell us, and he's, I'm sure, in his in inimitable way, uh, some stories about the history of Gerald. So I hope everybody will join us then. But before we do actually go, I just see there's another couple of things popped on to the questions. Let me just okay. see those. Um, OK, Jane says, wonderful talk. Thank you. And Jennifer from Australia again says, thanks so much. And she says, I've got some more stuff for you. Oh, my goodness. Send it <laughs> over. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. OK, well, thanks, Antalida, and thanks to everybody for attending. Hope to see you uh, last Thursday of next month. Thank you. Okay.